This is All Saints Blackheath in London. Today I'm being shown around the inside of the church by Dr Nicholas Cranfield and if you think the outside of the church looks good just you wait. This is Dr Nicholas Cranfield. Hello. And you're the, what do you call I'm it? the vicar here. The vicar here, okay. I've been here for the last 23 years. I, I guess I was maybe wondering whether there'd be something with all the saints on. Obviously, obviously you can't have all the saints, but maybe something with a lot of saints. There, there is, it's around the font. One is the baptism of Christ in the River Jordan. One is of the Baptist. And the central one is actually of all saints. And again, it follows an orthodox tradition of encompassing all the saints. Hodgkin's area. Thank you. Yes. Um, that icon is very special to this parish. One of the members of the wider parish, somebody who lived in the parish, uh, Terry Waite, so in this church throughout the period of his confinement, had been very much the centre for prayer and had been where the BBC had centred uh, their songs of praise when he was released. Terry Waite uh, then generously gave the parish uh, this icon, which is an 18th century Russian icon. The technical term is Our Lady who shows the way. So her hand gesture is pointing to Christ Jesus sitting in her left arm. Any icon, I mean, icons don't change. I mean, they're always the same. So um, you could think this was 15th century, 14th century. Um, but she's pointing to Jesus who is the way, the truth and the life. He, in turn, is holding a scroll uh, because Jesus is the second lawgiver. Uh, Christians want to say that Moses is the lawgiver from the Old Testament. Jesus comes to bring the law to fulfilment. And so it's a very lovely thing, um, and it's dedicated as being Our Lady help of all Christians, but particularly uh, for those who are facing persecution, uh, those who are imprisoned, and sadly, as relevant now as it was in 1992. Yeah. If not more so. Uh, if yeah. not more so. Yeah. But it makes very clear that this chapel is dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Um, and indeed, the rather colourful um, background to the, the altar here yeah. is a memorial from 1911-1913 uh, in honour of a doctor who died as a young man in 1911. And his family uh, had that. And these are the symbols of St Luke, and the tradition is that St Luke himself was a doctor. This, this is an icon rather than a statue. And, and that um, wouldn't be called a hodgetaria, or no. because, because of the hand gesture? No, no, no. It, it, it's, uh, hodgetaria is uh, in the Greek Orthodox and the Byzantine tradition, right. uh, and the Byzantine tradition doesn't have statues. Uh, they still only, to this day, have icons. Uh, the Western tradition, the Latin Western tradition of Western Europe, has statues, and so this is a statue of the Virgin Mary. Because of the detailing on the column is so similar to the Reredos I've just pointed out behind that altar, I think this also must date to about 1913. And the back of the church, the font cover, we know is 1917. So okay. somebody was working with this very similar style throughout the 1910s. Um, and the War Memorial screen is 1920, uh, and again uh, fits Perfectly. A lot of people think the church is much older because it looks medieval and it's based on a medieval screen in Exeter. In origin, I mean, it, we're obviously not quite seeing what was built in 1856. In 1856, yes. it was built as a 600-seater church, which meant people were absolutely crammed in. So the space that's now the Lady Chapel would have had pews all the way across oh, it. Facing, there, there were many yeah. facing inwards. There are yeah. many more seats here. Um, the organ has been here since 1858, and the organ chamber... Uh, hidden in behind all, all the false organ pipes would have taken up that space. But it would have been a large theatre intended primarily as a preaching house. I think the revival elements are both in the, of the Gothic arcading, uh, the, the lines of the roof, um, and you know, it's a significant building. It's, it's built by uh, a pupil of uh, Pugin. So Benjamin Ferry, who's the architect here, yes. was taught by Pugin's father. Yeah. So Benjamin Ferry and, and Pugin overlap, um, but certainly the styles are very similar. Um, Ferry's probably most prominent church is St Stephen's Rochester Row in central London. Uh, this is probably his most distinguished church outside central London. Um, when it was first built, it was ridiculed as being the three barns, and it was only later that the tower was added, uh, and that gives the asymmetry to the building. Oh, the tower the, wasn't... The, the tower was not originally part of the... The parish didn't have the money. OK. And so the parish was very grateful. They were granted the land by the Earl of Dartmouth, 
they raised nearly £3,000, uh, but they were only able to build so far. So the pews are not original. The pews came in a bit later when people could afford to buy the pews. Um, so the actual structure, although worship began here in November 1858, uh, is not really complete until the 1890s with both the, the tower and indeed the outside porch. Um, but yeah. So I find that, shall, shall I tell you why I find that remarkable? If you go up to the statue of General Wolfe uh, in Greenwich Park and you look down, it's a completely straight line and it's a completely straight line to the spire. Yeah. And yet that spy wasn't there when the, when the church... Was... No, that's absolutely right. And it, it is extraordinary because when, uh, initially when Blackheath began to develop, 1849, the railway line comes to uh, Blackheath and there's a station in Blackheath and people start to live here and commute. People started asking to have their own church here because previously it meant you were either in the parish of St Alphage, Greenwich, going down the hill, or indeed in uh, St Margaret's Lee, or as this parish originally was part of, uh, the church of St Mary Lewisham. So in the 1850s, there are people beginning to live here, houses being built, and people petitioned the Bishop of London. At that point, this was in the Diocese of London. They petitioned to have their own church building, primarily because they want to have a burial yard, because they say it's inconvenient having to take the dead elsewhere. And they discuss with the Earl of Dartmouth, who owns to this day uh, the Heath, uh, where best to situate a church, uh, there was initially, and it seems to have been the preferred suggestion, there was going to be a site much nearer to the centre of the village, opposite the Crown Pub, just at the end of, of what is now Royal Parade, um, Washerwoman's Bottom, as it's still called. Uh, that was one of the sites chosen. There was a further site over towards Montpellier Vale um, and two others. And then eventually it was this site that was chosen as a standalone building, uh, which was reasonably unusual because it was built on what had become common land, although it's still owned by the Earl of Dartmouth, and there were objections to this enclosing of this space sure. for the uh, building because of the it church. Was common, yes. Because it was technically common land, yeah. and in fact there was a petition, people go uh, and object, they go to the House of Lords, they complain to the Earl of Dartmouth, and he allegedly says that whilst he would never have allowed himself to sanction the building of a Presbyterian chapel or conventicle or a papist meeting house, and I think those are the terms he uses, um, the Church of England is open to all, so he was not enclosing it. So it's a, it's a, a nicety from the mid-19th century. Y yes, so but, but that, says something about what, it says something how about the church viewed itself at that and, point. And uh, how yeah. the church was seen across society. And indeed, it's uh, one of his own family members who becomes the first vicar here. Uh, so there's a long link in that sense. But when the church was built... The money wasn't sufficient for it to be completed, so there was intended to be a further two bays. It was going to go further to the west. And as you've spotted from the outside, there is still no burial yard. Yes. Uh, because by the time the initial structure had been completed, a roadway had been cut round the front of the church, and people then claimed access, and that stopped the church being built further out. And so we have no space for burial still, <laughs> yes, despite so, that so, being so, the original... And that was one of the problems that was the original was claim to, to having a, a, a church here, yeah. That's really amazing. Yeah. But it's also almost unique. I, I can't think of another church without a wall around it. No. Uh, uh, you know, may, may, maybe some cathedrals are set in there, yeah. enough grounds that yeah. it looks like they're yeah. not. But it's, it's a very yeah. low curtilage wall, and in fact, you can see in it, I mean, where the iron railings were that were taken out in the Second World War as uh, part, okay, of, so as part of the war effort to collect up uh, spare metal, um, and of course never returned after the war. Yeah. So it probably would have looked with, you know, metre high iron railings around. More a like bit, a, yeah. But, but it would have felt rather enclosed because at some points, I mean, the wall is only half a metre away from the church structure. Yeah, so it's, it's right there. It, it yeah. would be really imprisoned. There are no foundations, being a Victorian building, so I could lift a, a floorboard in the building and you could see the bare ground a foot and a half there's, down there's below. No there's no crypt. There's no crypt. I suppose when the, when the architect first designed the east end of the building, I mean, the central focus was going to always to be the altar. Uh, it's now been extended. Um, in fact, conveniently, you can see that originally the altar oh, was, yes. was literally just that width. OK. And we think it was extended in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but uh, there was a, a very dark, and I've only ever seen rather poor postcards of it, there was a very dark uh, scene of the crucifixion, Victorian stained glass, but very dramatic, but very, very dark. Um, 
the mosaic panels were brought in in the 1880s, and they come from Murano um, in Venice. Um, they're pattern book things. I suspect somebody simply just sent and said, can we have a set of, we need this number of niches to oh, be you filled. Oh, that, that I, might see, I might see these somewhere else? That you, they, these yeah, are out of, out the, of a catalogue? The, these are out of a catalogue, yeah, yeah, okay. but actually with the text in English rather than in Italian, yes. uh, which is kind of helpful. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, and so, so featuring uh, the evangelists and then uh, the narrative scenes, and then on either side of the altar, on this side we've got the transfiguration, on the other side we've got the baptism. Um, and I think they, they would probably have been the only initial decoration at this end of the building, but they are quite decorative, and that would have actually brought in quite a lot of um, excitement with the gold, the light coming through stained glass windows on the gold. Um, the actual painting of the canopy above the sanctuary is from the 1960s. The decorative work in the ceiling is, is from the 1960s when there was a lot of refurbishment undertaken for the roof. Um, and apart from the mosaic panels, uh, the only other highly decorated uh, features around here would have been the decorative angels at the end of each of the hammer beams. So the six angels on either side. Um, and when we had the, the church refurbished in 2006-07 to mark our 150th anniversary, yeah. Uh, the team that came in to do it, they explained to me, they discovered that the back of the angel's wings had never been painted. Uh, and would I like them to be painted? <laughs> a so, cost-saving so, initiative. <laughs> so, in fact, we did actually have, we did have the back of the angel's wings painted, and that's where the, the artists who actually did that work for us, they've inscribed their names as well. So one of the angels, I think is that one up there, um, has the names of those who, who painted, repainted and refurbished her. The organ I mentioned briefly before. Yeah, you said so. You said false organ pipes. Does that mean? The, the, that, does the, that mean what I think it means? Yes, it does. The, 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 none of those pipes that you can see uh, actually play. They're entirely decorative. Um, the organ chamber has over three thousand pipes in it, but you'll get some idea of just how extensive. Oh my goodness! Okay, yeah. Oh wow! Okay. And the shortest of the pipes is about six inches, and the tallest is 32 foot. Um, and as I say, there are nearly 3,000 of them. Now, the organist sits in the console over there. That, so okay, it's, that, it's yeah. a, a detached console of our first organist, Alfred Sellier. Um, so, and it would have been up until the 1890s, the only place in Blackheath where you could hear music. Um, because <laughs> okay. there, was, there was no conservatoire, there were no uh, Blackheath halls. So a lot of people would have actually, their first taste or, or hearing of music would have been physically in the building of the church. Is there something recorded that links uh, Sullivan to, to the church? Yes, there is, because um, we tend to think of Sullivan in, in partnership with Gilbert, mm -hmm. as in Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, but before that association, Arthur Sullivan had worked alongside our first organist here, this man called Celia. Celia was appointed to be the first organist of this church at the age of 14, nothing if not precocious. In the 1880s, uh, his opera, uh, an opera called Dorothy, was the most performed opera in this country, well outside the range of Carmen and anything else you might have ever heard of. Drank himself to death on the proceeds very early on. He died in his early 40s. Um, but Celia and Sullivan had worked together, and then Sullivan took up with Gilbert. So that's the link. Um, we also do know that Charles Gounod, who lived just on the edge of, of Blackheath, um, over towards Morden College, uh, he certainly played on the instrument here. The other composer who came here regularly during the war was, um, of course, Benjamin Britten, and that's because of the recording studios that were in Blackheath Park, okay. uh, just in the centre of the village here. So uh, the voiceover, the WH Auden for uh, the night train um, and a couple of the other propaganda films uh, that Britten uh, worked on the music for were actually all worked here in, in uh, Blackheath. And Britain's own diaries record coming in and coming into Blackheath. Oh, right, um, okay. And also eyeing up the soldiers on the platforms opposite, which is uh, well, very so much I've Benjamin said, Britain's I've line said, in life. The first time I came in this church, I could see this was going to be worth looking at. But it wasn't until I came round the corner that I really saw what I was missing. You've got to tell me about this. Unbelievable. I mean, I saw it. It looked like an old master. Yeah. This is the giveaway. The giveaway is that I appear in it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And the guy who painted this, Paul Lisak, who's a well-established artist here in London, yeah. 
uh, he uses old master techniques. So he primes his own canvases. He worked, I mean, this took him nearly nine months. And just to give you an idea of the scale, the figure of Christ on the cross is more than seven foot tall. So it was site specific, he knew the space, and he completed this in 2004, five. And when it was initially completed, it was shown in uh, an exhibition in London at uh, St. Bartholomew the Great. And then the parish took it in 2007. But what he wanted to do was uh, very much an old master's idea of situating the events of the Bible in the present day. So all the figures down below, although I suppose you could say that the Mary Magdalene figure holding the bottom of the cross yeah. and the weeping Mary behind her and John are sort of in biblical sort of Middle Eastern clothes, but all the rest of the figures are actually contemporary. That would have been uh, something that medieval church understood, something that the old masters understood in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. And it makes my life much easier because I have to explain to kids in my primary school yeah. what Christianity says about crucifixion. And there's always one child who goes home and says, Mummy, Father Nicholas is so old, he was at the crucifixion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which actually means this is working. And it also filled up, I mean, the rest of the buildings you see, because it's been whitewashed, is actually fairly blank. Yeah. But there was a big space above this south porch door, and it fits really, really well there. The actual gesture, so when I went into his studio and just saw the central panel, I simply just took my glasses off and stared and he then came back in and said, don't move. And I said, well, what's that about? And so the gesture was actually me having taken my glasses off and holding them. OK. Are there other, but, are there other contemporary people in the painting? Um, yes. The, the, both the good and the bad thief uh, are a cousin of his. It's the same model. Um, many artists historically often use their own family members uh, as models because they're cheaper. Yes. It is remarkable, I think, partly because of its size. And one of the things that uh, a lot of contemporary churches are scared of, I think, is making big public statements. Whereas this is a very large part, and yeah, it's very you, large for the Christian story. It, yeah, you yeah. do notice it. Yeah. And then you notice yeah. it again and then you, because and then of the contemporary... You start looking at the detail. Yeah. Um, but there's the city of Jerusalem, you can see in the background up there. Jesus is taken out on the road to Calvary, which actually comes from a Latin word, Golgotha, is from the Hebrew, the place of the skull. So the suggestion was that the crucifixion takes place above, and many artists depict uh, a skull beneath uh, the physical cross, which some want to say is actually the skull of Adam. So there's a whole tra tradition about that, calling it Golgotha, mm -hmm. uh, therefore derives from the, the Hebrew. And then a wonderful sense of, and, and the Bible tells us that the, the heavens were rent asunder and that there was effectively a, uh, an eclipse, so the darkening sky is an extraordinary moment, and just that visionary landscape behind. Yeah. It's a subject you see again and again, but you do really see it in you with this one. Yeah.